Uh, today we are very pleased to have Sean Carroll um, from Caltech, uh, the Water Institute of Theoretical Physics. Sorry? This is the Water Institute of Theoretical Physics. The Walter Burke, Walter Burke. Institute. Right. Yes. And he's working on theoretical cosmology and the uh, emergence of space time, basically. So today his talk is Locating Yourself in a Large Universe. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks for having me over here. Um, Two days ago, I was at Columbia uh, at a workshop organized by Justin Clark Duane about mathematics and morality. And I feel, I, I started, like, I didn't give a presentation, but you know, I chaired a session. I started by saying, you know, I, am a, I do not produce any mathematics or any morality, but I do consume, but I use them almost every day, right? So I feel the same way in a talk about the foundations of probability. So I'm not going to pretend that I'm an expert in any sense on the foundations of probability, but I use probability. I've been forced to think about those foundations in my uh, physics research. And so I'm hoping that the talk will be at least as educational, probably much more educational for me than for you. I'll talk about some, some foundational issues and, and you folks can help me figure out how I should be thinking about them. So the spe specific issue is, there are large universes that we contemplate as physicists and cosmologists where large has a very specific uh, meaning, not just very large, which the universe undoubtedly is, but you can imagine universes that are large enough that any local condition like you or this room or the existence of an intelligent observer happens many, many, many times. So some of these, uh, the, sort of the most famous example is the cosmological multiverse. If you believe in inflationary cosmology, it's very easy to make many, many regions of space where conditions could be very similar or very different, perhaps an infinite number of them. And then you want to know the question, the answer to the question, where am I in that multiverse? There's also the idea of Boltzmann brains in a randomly fluctuating universe. If you just have a box of gas that randomly fluctuates what's inside and that lasts forever, that gas will come into every allowed configuration an infinite number of times. And the universe can be like that. So observers can pop into existence, and we'll talk about that in some detail. But just so you don't think it's completely uh, speculative, the same thing happens if you're just in an open universe. That is to say, a universe that is either spatially flat or negatively curved cosmologically that goes on forever while remaining more or less homogeneous. So we live in a universe where there is a horizon. We can only see so far, but between us and the horizon, it looks quite smooth on large scales. There are fluctuations on large scales, but they're relatively small. And so if the universe is infinitely big and has these small fluctuations everywhere, then any particular configuration of stuff is going to occur an infinite number of times somewhere in the universe. You don't need inflation or quantum fluctuations to make this happen. So in these circumstances, you want to know, like, how do I reason probabilistically about my place in such a large universe? So there's two questions. One I'm going to claim I have an answer to, and one I'm not. So here's what we typically do. We say, well, there's many observers. Don't ask me what an observer is. That's a perfectly good question deserving of its own talk that I'm not going to give, but imagine we've agreed on what an observer is, and imagine we've partitioned the set of all possible observers into different groups. Um, so you might say like groups of uh, DNA-based observers and alternative biology-based observers, carbon-based observers and silicon-based observers, observers on Earth and observers not on Earth, whatever you want, there's different ways of doing the partitioning. And let's label our, or my, depending on how uh, narrow you want to be, subset U1. Okay, so you can't stop me from doing that. And here are the two questions. One question is, can we assign a probability to having been in U1? We know that we are in U1 by construction. Can we assign a probability to having been in that group? And from that, and the fact that we are in U1, draw conclusions about the nature of the universe beyond which what we can see. Now, I phrased it both carefully and awkwardly because I think it's an awkward question to ask, but it's one that is very, very frequently asked. This is basically the idea of can we think about the anthropic principle? Can we imagine there are many, many places in the universe with different observers, different conditions, and can we reason something along the lines of saying, well, in this ensemble, it would have been likely that we would see this thing. We don't see that thing, therefore we probably don't live in that ensemble. Is that a valid question to ask? I don't know. 
I used to think that I knew, but my confidence has uh, deteriorated over time. So I think this is an interesting question I'm going to highlight but not answer. There's a simpler question I think we can answer, which is that given that we're in U1, given that we're in whatever group that we've decided to highlight, can we assign probabilities within that group and can we draw conclusions from that? So it, it might be, and in fact I will consider the case where the group U1 is as narrow as observers that have exactly my macroscopic configuration right now. So by that I mean observers who are standing in rooms wearing these clothes with my mental state seeing people like you. Observers like that there could be an infinite number of them in the large universe can I draw conclusions on the basis of some probability distribution. So those are the questions. Let's start with the question I don't know the answer to. Number one. Here's what we should accept. Everyone accepts Bayes' theorem. It's a theorem, right? Of course, we can talk about what it means, and there, the, there are interpretational issues that, that get in there. So I presume in a seminar called The Foundations of Probability, you've seen Bayes' theorem before. I presume I haven't had a typo when I typed it, but uh, it, it's a way to draw conclusions about the probability of different theories being true, given some new data that you got in terms of the likelihood function and the prior probabilities for those theories. So this should apply to cosmology, and the question is, in this large universe context, it seems that we could imagine the meaning of the likelihood function, the probability of the data given the theory, in different ways. It could be, uh, given that so, given that we are observers at all, what is the probability, so if the data is the data that we have about us, right? We are observers, we live on a planet, we breathe air, we're made of carbon, etc. Is the probability of that data, given different cosmological models, the probability that we would have ended up being the observers that we are? In, among all the observers we could possibly be? Or is it the probability that there exist observers like me that I see? So one example that I gave in earlier talks, but not in this one, but maybe it's clarifying given that this is not very clear, I think. Imagine that the universe was a string of bits, zeros and ones in some way, right? And there's two possible theories of the string of bits. One is that the string of bits is zero, 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 and it's nothing but zeros. The other cosmological model is the string of bits is randomly chosen ones and zeros. One, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, one, et cetera, right? You wake up and you look around and you're an observer in this toy model of the universe and you see that to your left and to your right, there's nothing but zeros for 50 zeros in either direction. So there's 101 zeros in a row. Does that observation count as evidence against the theory that the zeros and ones are just randomly selected? Because in both cosmological models, there would exist, with probability one, some string of 101 or any number of zeros in a row. So the fact that you're that observer, should that give you new information or not? That's the question. It seems intuitively like that should count as evidence, right, against the idea that they're just random, but it turns out to be a little bit more subtle than that. So. In particular, there's many different applications of that question. I'm going to focus in on this Boltzmann brain problem. This is uh, a particular case where we're going to really do exactly as I suggested, focus in on the class of observers who are observers who have exactly my macroscopic data. So this comes from cosmology. I think that every foundations of, philosophy, of uh, probability talk should have data in it. So these are data. That, this is the data uh, from the Supernova Cosmology Project and Hi-Z Supernova team that taught us in 1998 that the universe is not only expanding but accelerating. A fact that we attribute, most likely, although we're not completely sure, to vacuum energy. This is an artist's impression of vacuum energy. This is just if you take a little cubic centimeter of space and you empty it out, so it's completely empty, and you ask yourself how much energy is contained in this completely empty cubic centimeter of space. According to Albert Einstein, the answer is not zero, necessarily. The answer is some constant of nature, the inherent energy of the vacuum, the vacuum energy. And these data indicate that the answer isn't zero. The answer is 10 to the minus 8 ergs per cubic centimeter. And the action of this vacuum energy is to push galaxies apart. That's what we seem to be observing in the data. And the nice thing about this, well, nice or not, the simplest model, Einstein's cosmological constant, implies that the vacuum energy is strictly constant. It does not dilute away as the universe expands. So not only is the vacuum energy making the universe accelerate, 
in the simplest model, not necessarily the only possible model, but in the simplest model, it will do so forever. The universe will continue to expand and accelerate for infinity years toward the future. That's not necessary, but it's a completely plausible, straightforward cosmological model. And there's various consequences of that. In the 1970s, Stephen Hawking taught us that if you have a black hole, if you take into account quantum field theory around the black hole, the black hole isn't completely black, the horizon seems to be giving off black body radiation at a certain temperature. In an accelerating universe, which approaches a space-time metric called de Sitter space, when it's empty except for this vacuum energy, there's a cosmological horizon around us. So rather than looking at the black hole horizon from outside, we're looking at the cosmological horizon from the inside, but the same phenomenon holds true. There's radiation, and it has a temperature, and the temperature turns out for our real world universe to be about 10 to the minus 30 Kelvin. Remember that the actual cosmic microwave background radiation in our universe today is about 2.7 Kelvin. So this radiation is really, really cold. So we're not going to ever see it. But if the universe expands and empties out forever, there's a feature called the cosmic no hair theorem that in a universe with vacuum energy plus other stuff, if the universe doesn't recollapse, the vacuum energy always wins in the end. It pushes everything away, smooths everything else out. We will eventually be left with an empty universe that doesn't have a microwave background in it anymore because every one of those microwave background photons in the current universe will be redshifted to a, a length scale larger than our horizon size. And this will be what is left in the universe, this thermal radiation uh, that, that a thermometer would detect. So there's a subtlety here that I'll get to in a second, but, at, but before we get to the subtlety, let's just take this picture at face value. So if you look, if you have a particle detector outside a black hole, you see a thermal spectrum of radiation coming out. If you have a particle detector in an otherwise empty accelerating universe, you see a thermal spectrum of radiation coming at you from all directions. That has implications for the future of the universe. You might think that if the cosmic no hair theorem is true, the universe just empties out and there's no more observers, so we don't have to worry about them. But Ludwig Boltzmann figured out a long time ago that if you live in a universe which has random fluctuations, usually it's in thermal equilibrium. Usually the entropy as a function of time, which is this uh, toy model in the top box over here, it's usually stuck at its maximum value. That's why there seems to be an upper limit here. This is the maximum entropy you can have in a box of gas. But it will occasionally fluctuate downward, right? There's a standard undergraduate statistical mechanics calculation given the air in this room, how long will you have to wait for all the air to fluctuate onto one side of the room? The answer is very, very long, but in this picture you have infinity years to wait. So Boltzmann pointed out that, uh, sorry, he didn't, he pointed, what he pointed out strictly speaking was that if you waited long enough, from the background thermal equilibrium in an eternal universe, you would fluctuate something like what he called our world, which by which he meant the Milky Way galaxy. That's what they knew about. They knew about a part of the Milky Way galaxy. He didn't know about the whole galaxy and everything, other galaxies. But there is a rate for these fluctuations. There will be fluctuations downward in entropy, but very naturally, small fluctuations are much more probable, much more frequent than large fluctuations. Exponentially uh, suppressed, it will be the larger fluctuations. So if you wait long enough, in an eternal universe, you're in an empty universe with radiation coming at you from the cosmological horizon, it's not predictable when it comes. It's, it's quantum fluctuations in the truest sense. So you can't predict exactly what will happen. Sometimes a slightly more energetic than average photon will come hit your detector. Sometimes a whole bunch of energetic photons will just by chance hit your detector at the same time. Sometimes enough energetic photons will hit your detector to create some matter and antimatter, right? In reverse, uh, in pair production kind of things. This might lead to all sorts of different things popping randomly into existence. And you can run the numbers. It's very unlikely, but you can make a galaxy or a solar system or the whole universe if you're willing to wait long enough just out of these random fluctuations. So you can ask yourself, and you know, yeah, you can ask yourself, Boltzmann himself said, maybe that's our universe. He said, maybe we come from a low entropy past because we live in a universe that's mostly in thermal equilibrium, but if you wait long enough, it will occasionally fluctuate downward to low entropy, and then we're in the portion where it's relaxing back. We're at point X on that graph. 
The problem with this was pointed out by Eddington a few decades later. He says, look, you have a knowledge of how frequent these fluctuations are. They're much more frequent when they're small fluctuations than when they're large fluctuations. So the game you should play is, you tell me what kind of fluctuation you want to wait for. Do you want to wait for a fluctuation into a galaxy? Or do you just want to wait for a fluctuation into an observer? Right? Eddington picked mathematical physicists as the thing you should wait for. <laughs> and he said, if you want to wait until there's a fluctuation into a mathematical physicist, then what you will see is a fluctuation that creates that mathematical physicist and nothing else. The rest of the universe will still be in thermal equilibrium because that's the smallest possible fluctuation that would make that physicist. Albrecht and Sorbo more recently pointed out if you're doing the anthropic principle, then you don't really need a mathematical physicist. In fact, you don't even need a whole person. You just need a brain, you need enough particles to assemble themselves into the form of a central nervous system that has the capability of sort of looking around going, ha, huh, thermal equilibrium, and then it will die. And this is called a Boltzmann brain, and this is the minimal thing you could possibly make from random fluctuations that would qualify as a conscious, intelligent observer. If you personally have stronger conditions on what it means to be an intelligent conscious observer, then that's fine. The point is you will satisfy those most frequently by waiting for the smallest possible fluctuation into them. So that's a problem if you think that we live in this universe that is expanding and accelerating. At, the, at face value, it says that we live in a universe which toward the future will be eternal and will be thermal will be undergoing fluctuations randomly into different configurations. So there will be an infinite number of Boltzmann brains in our future. There will also be recurrences of our universe in the future, but the total number of observers will be by far dominated by these Boltzmann brains because they're the easiest ones to make. That doesn't seem to be the universe we live in. That's the usual problem. So I'm going to talk about that problem. But does everyone get the scenario, the idea that Boltzmann brains fluctuate randomly into existence. Note that I didn't predict this on the basis of string theory or eternal inflation or anything like that. This is the theory that we think correctly describes the actual world based on data, right? The theory that cosmologists call lambda CDM, cosmological constant lambda and CDM cold dark matter, seems to predict this. Yeah? You said that doesn't seem to be the world that we live in. Well, that's what we're here to discuss. I will discuss exactly that. Yes, that's right. We don't seem to be Boltzmann brains. Let's put it that way. But we'll discuss it. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah? Do we need to be Boltzmann brains for there to be a bunch of Boltzmann brains? Yeah, well, uh, well, okay. well that's exactly why we're here, to discuss that. Yes, good. Here's the, there's a footnote that, that uh, I would say makes the Boltzmann brain problem in the real world considerably less pressing than it would otherwise be. I, I try to be uh, precise, but I'm not sure whether I was, talking about these fluctuations into Boltzmann brains in a cosmological horizon. There's a bit of a uh, sloppiness here because in these cosmological settings, quantum mechanics, uh, you need to be a little bit more careful about your quantum mechanics than you would if you're in a laboratory with a Geiger counter, okay? I made statements about what a detector would observe in the sitter space with a horizon around it with a certain temperature, but guess what? There aren't any detectors doing any observing in the sitter space. It's empty, okay? So what you actually evolve toward is a thermal state, and there is a difference in quantum mechanics with thermal states versus classical mechanics. Classically, when you have a thermal state of the gas in this room, the, thermal, the thermalness says that there is a temperature probability, a probability distribution for the positions and velocities of the air molecules that depends on the temperature, but there's also a microstate. The macrostate of air, which is just constant density in a certain fixed temperature, is static. It's not changing over time, but that's just because there's a microstate that is changing without affecting the macroscopic properties. Quantum mechanically, a thermal state is a density operator that is a superposition of stationary energy eigenstates. The individual microstates of which the thermal state is made don't themselves evolve with time. And therefore, if you don't have a detector there, there isn't anything fluctuating. 
in a thermal state in quantum mechanics. There isn't anything changing over time. When I speak all these words, I, you know, I betray my Everettian uh, prejudices. So if you have a different favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics, you can reanalyze this issue. But the point is, this is a, an image of um, the wave function of an electron in a helium atom in a certain energy eigenstate. The point is that if you're an Everettian, this is what's real. There's not really an electron fluctuating around in different parts of the, wave, of the uh, atom. There's really a wave function. And it's not changing at all. So it's not fluctuating at all. So there's no sense dynamically in an Everettian version of the universe where things fluctuate dynamically into existence even in De Sitter space, even with a cosmological horizon. If it's true that dynamically you approach this thermal state. Yes? Yeah, so I, I'm just kind of wondering about the sense of fluctuation here. There might not be quantum fluctuations, but there could still be a thermal fluctuation, the Hungary currents type. So you can prove a similar by reversibility arguments, similar kind of. You Hungary. can't. You can't because it's not a closed system and the recurrence theorem doesn't apply. So are we assuming it's an open system here? Or? It is an open system. We're not assuming it. This is a real cosmology that we're doing. Things leave the horizon. It is I mean, the expanding. Yeah, that's right. The horizon is a fixed size. Physical particles and excitations leave it. So this, in in, well, oh, I, will, oh, yeah. I will tell you the, the the point. The point is that if the vacuum energy persists eternally and Hilbert space is finite dimensional, the Hilbert space of the whole of reality, then there's a recurrence theorem. Then you really will get these fluctuations into Boltzmann brains, etc. But in quantum field theory, or in the simplest uh, extrapolation that you would have from inside our, what, what happens inside our horizon is described by a finite dimensional part of Hilbert space. But what happens outside our horizon may or may not be. So the claim is that if the, outs, if the rest of the universe outside our observable horizon is described by an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, then we are described by a dissipative dynamics. What happens inside our horizon does indeed settle down to a thermal state which is actually stationary and actually stays there. Recurrence theorems be damned. So I don't know whether the Hilbert space of the theory of everything is finite dimensional or infinite dimensional. If it's infinite dimensional, you get rid of the Boltzmann brains. If it's you finite dimensional, they're still there. There would be fluctuations. That's because the Borden probabilities would come from the, the That's right. Detector. Yeah, and you would certainly, the, the existence of the detector would, by construction, say you were not in the thermal state, right? So in a true thermal state, you would be stationary. You will get to a thermal state if you have an infinite bath around you, you would not get to it if there's only a finite dimensional Hilbert space for the whole world. Just, so, just to make sure, so suppose I start from um, T0 and I evolve into a thermal state at T, and by reversibility I can start from T and reverse back to T0. Um, if you're in a closed system, you will not evolve into a thermal state at T if you don't start with one, because thermal states are stationary. I see. Just like you will never evolve into an energy eigenstate if you don't start in one. Just start with one. Yeah. Okay, so this is all just a footnote to say that maybe we can get out of the Boltzmann brain problem in the real world, but maybe we don't, so we should figure out what to do if we land ourselves in it. Ah, I have a lot to say. Okay, so here is uh, to fix our ideas. Here are two cosmological models, A and B, just to simplify our lives. A has no Boltzmann brains. We just have ordinary observers. I picked quasi-randomly some large number of ordinary observers. The point is that if you live in a universe with Boltzmann brains, very typically the number of Boltzmann brains is enormously larger. So the chance that there is some interesting competition between the number of ordinary observers and the number of Boltzmann brains is very, very, very low in the space of all possible cosmological models. Either you generally don't have them at all, or you generally completely dominate Boltzmann brains. Okay, so these are two very typical models. A has no Boltzmann brains, just ordinary observers. B has the same number of ordinary observers and a huge number, exponentially exponential, of Boltzmann brains. So the question is, as we're getting to, can we rule out cosmological model B on the basis of empirical information. We look around and go, in B, there's a lot more Boltzmann brains. I should probably be a Boltzmann brain. I'm not. And therefore, we should rule that out. This is a very common argument that is made by uh, working cosmologists. Not all of them agree with it, but it's an argument. 
OK, so here is what I would call the standard argument. This is just a slight formalization of, that of those words I just said. Remember what A and B are. A is no Boltzmann brains. B is with Boltzmann brains. The standard argument says we look at Bayes' theorem. And there's a probability uh, that we're trying to figure out, are we in theory A or theory B? So we calculate the likelihood function. What are the probability of getting our data given the theory? And the standard argument says the data is, I'm not a Boltzmann brain. I'm a person giving a talk. I remember the past. It's reliable, etc. I did not just fluctuate into existence. You're all here, etc. And there's a probability that that was going to be true. It's roughly speaking the number of ordinary observers by the t divided by the total number of observers, which is 1 in theory A and infinitesimally tiny in theory B. Therefore, it's almost irrelevant what the prior was. If you have roughly comparable priors for theory A and theory B, the fact that I wake up every morning and see that I'm not a Boltzmann brain is evidence that theory A is true and theory B is false. Okay? That's the usual argument that as working cosmologists, we should try to construct models which do not have Boltzmann brain domination. And this idea that in each theory, we should sort of give a uniform probability to being any observer, maybe in some reference class, but you tell me what reference class you want to choose and I should be randomly chosen from within inside that class, has been called the Cosmological Copernican principle, principle of mediocrity, typicality, self-sampling, proportion, indifference. Many people have suggested different things like this. Yes? Uh, what did you say D was, the data? The data is I wake up and I'm not a Boltzmann brain. Okay. So how do you know that's the, the data? That's a good question, yes. <laughs> I'm just giving you the standard argument that the scare quotes should let you know I do not believe the standard argument, okay? So that's, we, that's what we need to think about a little bit, yeah. This is, what, this is what people say. So um, this leads to problems. Here's one of the problems, the presumptuous philosopher problem. And th th there's many other people who've worked on this. And I think I have the ideas right. I don't always have the labels of the ideas right. So uh, this is my version of the presumptuous philo philosopher problem. Uh, I think Bostrom coined the title. I think presumptuous physicist is just as accurate. But the point is that the kind of reasoning we're doing here is to say, to imagine that we are typical elements of some big set. And that is to say, within that big set, we should give a uniform probability to being any element of that set. And if we do that, and we notice we're not exactly sure what is going on in that set, in this case the set is all intelligent observers in the universe, we're not exactly sure what properties the set as entirety has, then by the fact that we have certain characteristics, we can conclude that that's a typical thing for an observer, an element of this set to have. The presumptuous philosopher problem is that gives us enormous leverage over the state of the universe, far beyond what we're actually warranted to have on the basis of any either reasoning or evidence. So the example given by Hartle and Trednicki is, you know, imagine there's no intelligent life in the universe other than here in the solar system. And for some reason, I have really good reason to believe that there's a 50% chance that floating in the atmosphere of Jupiter, there is 100 trillion intelligent gas bags, you know, floating in the atmosphere like Carl Sagan imagined a long time ago. Maybe they're there, maybe they're not. Those are the two theories. Everything else is exactly the same about the universe. Hartle and Trinicki point out that by this reasoning, if, if I use that model of the universe, I would predict that I was an intelligent gas bag in the atmosphere of Jupiter. I observe that I am not, and therefore I rule out that model to very good confidence. So I'm able to say something about the existence of intelligent gas bags in the atmosphere of Jupiter without ever looking at the atmosphere of Jupiter. That seems wrong, right? And if you believe that that's wrong, then there, there are similar arguments. Uh, the doomsday argument says that we are a typical person in the history of humanity, right? And so humanity's been around for a certain number of years. Uh, it is unlikely that we are in the first 1% of the lifetime of humanity, right? And therefore, we can conclude there's probably not going to be any human beings alive in the far future because then we would be atypical. Then we would be finding ourselves living right in the beginning. So we're predicting the end of humanity just on the basis of our existence now. There's the assumption that you're just as likely to be any human being as any other. That's right. That is the assumption. Sorry, right? That is exactly the assumption, yes. That is this typicality assumption that these guys want to call into question. 
but it's the same assumption that is being given in the standard version of the Boltzmann brain argument, that we are typical observers in the universe. Typical observers are Boltzmann brains. We don't seem to be. Therefore, we rule out their existence. The, the reason why this should worry you is that it, when you say, I'm going to assume I am a typical observer in the universe, it sounds kind of self-effacing. Right? It sounds kind of humble. I'm just a typical guy, right? But in fact, what you're assuming is that a typical observer in the universe is like you. That is not humble at all. That is extremely arrogant. That is extremely presumptuous. It's, like I said, giving you enormous leverage over the state of the universe far beyond what you collected any data about. So that is the presumptuous philosopher problem. Should we be able to reason in this way that lets us draw sweeping conclusions about the rest of the universe without leaving our armchairs? I agree with this. I agree that this is a problem. I agree that that standard argument, just on this basis, there's, there's other criticisms of it, but I think that it is true that reasoning on the basis that we should be chosen from a uniform distribution over all intelligent observers, and we can use features that we already know about our current existence as evidence against uh, different cosmological models, that sounds wrong. That sounds a little bit too presumptuous. So how to fix it? What can we do instead? What Harlan and Shrednicki say is that when you have a theory that has some kind of um, distribution of observers, then your theory is not simply specified by the physical state of reality. Your theory is also specified by different zero graphic distributions, which is to say different probability distributions that you were chosen randomly or you were chosen from this distribution on all possible observers in the universe. That is part of the specification of a theory in their mind. And they say, I can test different zerographic distributions that I update just using Bayes' theorem on my zerographic distributions just as I update on my physical model of reality. So they say, for example, they could choose the zerographic distribution that says, I simply have no probability for being a Boltzmann brain, and I'm uniformly chosen from the ordinary observers in the cosmology. So if, you're, if you grant yourself this ability, then the fact that there are many, many Boltzmann brains is irrelevant, because you have defined your theory to say there are many, many Boltzmann brains, but I'm not one of them. Therefore, the fact that I wake up and see I'm not a Boltzmann brain tells me nothing about anything. In other words, they're saying that it's not that there aren't Boltzmann brains, it's that whether or not there are is irrelevant to me because I see that I'm not one. Okay? I don't buy this either. I'm just telling you that this is a, a strategy. So here's why I don't buy this, because this zerographic distribution that they're choosing is not based on anything about the kind of observer you see yourself to be, but rather some God's eye view on where you find yourself in the universe. In other words, this zerographic distribution discriminates not on the basis of who you are, but of where you are in the four-dimensional universe. So to make this a little bit more uh, vivid, forget about Boltzmann brains. Forget about little disembodied pieces of protoplasm that come together just long enough to notice that they are uh, conscious and then go away. Consider this room right now, okay? Consider yourself and what you see and the macroscopic features, maybe not necessarily the microstate of every atom, but the macroscopic features that we believe are more or less accurately describing this room. So that means the existence of all of us, what we are seeing, also our mental states, the fact that our neurons are wired in certain ways, okay? That is a certain class of observers, observers like me who see you right now. Okay? And there should be an infinite number of them in an infinitely big universe. But if I'm in the Boltzmann fluctuating universe, if I'm in this uh, finite dimensional de Sitter space, et cetera, et cetera, the overwhelming number of appearances of people like me in this room are minimal fluctuations given those conditions. So there is no reason for there to be something called New Jersey transit outside. There's no reason for there to be New York the overwhelmingly strong prediction of this theory is that I walk outside and it should be thermal equilibrium. Okay? Now, Hartle and Shrednicki, so these, this is what I call a Boltzmann U. Right? And again, you can tweak the exact definitions of what class you're conditionalizing over. But the point is that fluctuations into rooms exactly like this giving us much more comfortable and reasonable observers than a disembodied brain are still nevertheless way more likely than ordinary observers. 
So all of your knowledge, if you're a Boltzmann U, then all of your knowledge about the outside world randomly fluctuated into your brain. There's no reason for it to have any strong correlation with reality outside. Okay, just randomly fluctuated into your brain. So Hartle and Schrodinger say, sure, they agree with the counting, but they say, I'm going to give a zero graphic distribution that simply rules that out. I give zero probability to being one of those Boltzmann U's. I think that is completely unfair. And it, to be honest, I tried to make this into like a sciencey philosophical argument, but it really just bothers me. That's, what, that's the best argument I can give you. It seems like cheating to me, okay? It seems like in the universe that had both ordinary observers and Boltzmann U's, all these fluctuations, I mean, the Boltzmann U's, you know, they, they live. They have feelings. Uh, they, they talk about things. They're, you know, they have some beliefs about the external world. And if you put a zero graphic distribution in this cosmology that excluded by fiat the idea that I could be any one of them, then all of them would be wrong, right? It seems unfair. It seems like it's, it, you shouldn't be, it, it makes sense if I bought into the zero graphic distribution idea, it seemed like it should be okay for observers who see different things to count as different parts of the distribution, to be given different weights, but not observers that see exactly the same thing just because they do or do not have pasts that are thermodynamically sensible. I don't see why we should discriminate against the Boltzmann U's. In fact, I think that we can do better than that. Let us... Uh, narrow our reference class that we're looking at to, as we said, observers who are macroscopically identical. So I am here in this room talking to you. Let me consider the set of observers exactly like me up to whatever macroscopic precision I'm able to perceive, okay? And again, in a big universe, there might be an infinite number of such people. So can I make statements about which one of them I am? So this is the well-known uh, problem in philosophy, I think it's pretty well-known, of self-locating uncertainty or indexical uncertainty under a large class of observers. So we really, I mean, it's not that uh, this is a better question to think about than the broader anthropic question, but it should be an easier question to think about. If we can't solve the puzzle of how to reason about identical observers, then there's no way we're going to solve the puzzle of how to reason about different observers. So how do we figure out which one of the identical observers we are? Hartle and Schrodinger would say, I can make up a distribution and then I should just test that distribution against the data. So here's different uh, attitudes. One is indifference. That is to say, if I truly have macroscopically indistinguishable observers, I should just give equal probability to being any of them. That's a simple, obvious thing to do. Uh, David Albert and probably many other people have said, I should just not do reasoning in this situation. I should just say I have no clue what the distribution is. You can't really make even a prediction in this particular situation. It's sort of just a, a game you play without any uh, point to it to make probabilistic predictions in this uh, situation. Hartle and Shrednicki would say that they want to put some, they want to attribute a zerographic distribution as part of their theory. I want to basically argue in favor of indifference, but I don't want to argue it as an assumption. I think we can do better than that. I think we can derive indifference under certain circumstances, and you may or may not agree with the axioms that it takes me to derive it, but uh, that'll be the strategy that I take. All right, so there is uh, work done on this. Um, Adam Elga, I don't know if he ever comes to these uh, seminars, but he wrote this paper. So this is a, um, what I'm going to tell you for the next couple slides is work that I did with uh, Chip C Sabins. Um, back when Chip was a graduate student studying philosophy of physics, he spent a summer at Caltech talking with me and other people. And uh, as a philosopher of physics, you know, he was skeptical about the Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. And I said, that's too bad because Everett is clearly correct. And he said, well, there's a good reason to doubt it because you can't get the probability right. And we argued about it and eventually we came up with a new derivation of getting the probability right. So it started, here was Chip's argument. He says, there's this paper by Elga that says that if there are two copies of you in the universe and they're identical, you should give equal probability to being either one of them. That's indifference. And Elga doesn't simply just, you know, he doesn't, he's not Laplacian about it. He doesn't say, well, what else could it be? He purports to give an argument based on fairly uh, reasonable assumptions that derives this. And if that's true, you would raise a problem with Everettian quantum mechanics. So here is the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, or Everettian, uh, for those of you who are not experts. It's a very simple theory. In every theory of quantum mechanics, you have quantum states, 
which are vectors in something called Hilbert space. And in every theory of quantum mechanics, those states evolve usually according to the Schrodinger equation. There's some Hamiltonian, which gives you the time derivative of the state, okay? Other theories of quantum mechanics take that beautiful structure and mess with it. They change the Schrodinger equation now and again, or they add more variables, or they deny the existence of an external reality, or something like that. Everett tries to say, I don't need to add to that structure. I can just believe that that's the world. The world is a state vector evolving smoothly and deterministically according to Schrodinger's equation. But what happens is, here's an example. This is a cat that is in a superposition of awake and asleep. No reason to kill the cat, I don't think. So, of course, a real macroscopic cat would be interacting with its environment and so forth. So think of the cat as a stand-in for an electron and spin up and spin down, okay? Cat's cuter. And here's an observer. This is Hugh Everett, before he, actually probably after he got kicked out of physics for proposing the Everett interpretation. And what happens, according to Everett, is that you just solve the Schrodinger equation here you start in an unentangled quantum state. So the observer is in what's called the ready state, hasn't yet looked at the cat. The cat is in a superposition. And the action of the Schrodinger equation is to say the observer looks at the cat and the wave function of the universe evolves in a superposition of the cat was awake and the observer saw the cat awake, plus the cat was asleep and the observer saw the cat was asleep. And Everett's brilliant leap is more therapeutic than physical. He says, and that's okay. <laughs> he says, you don't need to do anything more. There are actually now two copies of you. There was one person, it's not two copies of you, there are two people. There's one person here, it evolves smoothly into two people. A person who has your memories in the past, but now witnesses seeing an awake cat, and a person who has your memories of the past, but now witnesses seeing a sleep cat. As long as you're happy, if you're this person, you saw the cat asleep, as long as you're willing to accept that there's somewhere else in reality, a copy of you that saw the cat awake, everything is fine and you match uh, your experience for these different observers. Or at least you hope you do, that's the, you know, not everyone agrees. So here is a big problem, here's a worry. What if you read Elga's paper and were convinced in this indifference principle? If you were convinced that if you had a universe with different observers who are in locally identical states, you should give them equal probability. There's a rule in quantum mechanics, the Born rule, that says that when I have a wave function, I have these amplitudes outside the different parts of the quantum state, and they add up, they obey Pythagoras' theorem, the sum of them is equal to one, and each individual one has the feature that this number squared is the probability that I will end up observing that particular outcome when I do it. So in this particular wave function, if there's a 1 over root 3 outside the awake cat and a one square root of 2 thirds outside the asleep cat, before the measurement is made, the observer would say, I have a 1 third probability of seeing the cat awake, 2 thirds seeing the cat asleep. But an Algaean would notice that these two observers are in identical local conditions. They haven't looked at the cat yet. The, cats, the, the observer and the cat are not yet entangled. There's only one observer, or if you like, there are two observers, but they haven't noticed yet which branch of the wave function they're on. So if you bought Elga's argument straightforwardly or naively, you would say, I would give a 50-50 chance to being either one of these two observers, right? That is not the Born rule. That is not what quantum mechanics predicts. So this is what Chip said seems to be a good objection to taking Everett seriously as a theory of the world. What we eventually were able to do is to dig into Elga's argument and notice that there was a hidden assumption. It wasn't very hidden, but it wasn't you know, underlined either. And so rather than taking his conclusion at face value, we took the assumption, we generalized it to a case where, which included quantum mechanics, and we found that when you took the assumption seriously, you don't get indifference over different branches of the wave function. In fact, what you get is exactly the Born rule for quantum probabilities. So I'll show you that very quickly. The assumption is something that we call the epistemic separability principle, or ESP, which is not a principle of indifference. A principle of indifference would say, I have two things, one of them is true, one of them is not, I can't tell which one, they seem pretty similar, I'll give them 50-50 credence, okay? The epistemic separability principle says, um, something's gonna happen, there's a probability that different outcomes will happen. I don't know what those probabilities are, but whatever they are, they don't depend on things going on elsewhere in the universe. So it's a separability principle, not an indifference principle. 
I think it's a little bit more, uh, it seems to be assuming less, but that's uh, uh, in the eye of, of the observer. Yes? Does the uh, environment of one of the identical subsystems include the other identical subsystems, or does the environment refer to? Yeah, it does. It does? Yeah, that's right. So I'll give you examples, but yes. Um, well, maybe you don't want to answer this now, but how are, you, are the probabilities supposed to be degrees of belief? Or are they they are, yes. So they're not supposed to be features of the, the world? It's, a, it's an epistemic view of what the probabilities are. That's right, because it's self-locating uncertainty. Yeah. So here is the classical uh, example of what we have in mind. Here are two observers, locally identical in the world. Somewhere else, so they're asking themselves, which one of these am I? They have different locations, different indices. Uh, somewhere else in the world, something's going on. There are aliens somewhere else in the world, okay? So the ESP doesn't tell you what the probability being this or this does yet. All it says is, if there's another universe where there's also two identical people and they also want to know which one they probably are, whatever answer these ones gave better be the same as these ones give, even if the external environment is different. Even if there are mean aliens in the one universe and happy aliens in the other one, okay? That's what the ESP says, that changing you know, the color of the president's socks or changing the aliens out there shouldn't change what your predictions are for the particular question you're asking about these identical observers. Again, you're very, this is an assumption. It's not just automatic, but it's a pretty straightforward, simple assumption, I think. So we claim that uh, Elga secretly, yes. Oh, sorry. You were first. What do you mean by identical? Uh, whatever you want me to mean. Well, you tell me if, what, if what you counts. If really mean identity, then that statement is vacuous, right? So you must mean something. The same macroscopic uh, situation. Same, mac like, immediately no knowable stuff about your situation. So distinct up to... Yeah, certainly distinct. These are, these are definitely different observers or in different parts of the universe, right? They don't know which part they're in. But if they look around where they are and they ask people what they're thinking locally, they get exactly the same answer. That's right. The little red disks are the same, but the locations in the bigger universe are different. Yeah. So these are yeah. So the, oh, these are distinct observers. No, they're the same. They're, they're, I guess I'm one. I'm in one of these two. Yes. This is a person. This is you. Yeah. This is somebody else. But you don't know whether you're this person or this person. That's what you want to know. Um, I guess from my perspective, I guess how could I tell the difference? How could I even know there is somebody else? And if I saw them, would I recognize that it's not me? I mean, By the time you saw them, you would no longer be in identical local circumstances. I mean, you can go explore the universe and notice that there are aliens out there. So this is not an eternal condition. This is just for right now. So I'm taking it for granted. I have, so I can't observe the other observer. That's right. You don't know, yeah, then you would know. Then that would be a difference between you and them. So I think it will make more sense. You might be exactly alike. Yeah, exactly. But, you might, but, but there might be these two guys, that's all there is. They're looking at each other, they look exactly alike. Mm -hmm. So would you, under those circumstances, they're macroscopically exactly alike. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true, that's very possible. Think that they're located in different places. Right, but they might not have any idea. They don't, all they would do is to say we're located in different places. That would be true for both of them. That's right, exactly. So they would say the same things. Their conditions are identical. That's, I shouldn't, I mean, maybe, I think identical has, is, is carrying connotations I don't want it to have. The same. Same local conditions. They would, they would answer any question if you ask them right now with the same answer. So I think this is, this is sort of a cosmologist's way of thinking about it. Let's just give you Elga's way of thinking about it and maybe it will uh, make more sense for some reason. You can tell me why. Uh, whereas cosmologists like to think about different people in the universe, philosophers like to think about duplication and transportation machines, right? Uh, teleportation machines. So um, here's Elga's thought experiment. There's a person named Al. You put Al to sleep and you duplicate Al to make an exactly identical copy. So there are now two people. There is the original Al and there's a new person which we call dupe, all right? But they're in exactly the same state and you wake them up and you put them in rooms that look exactly the same. So when you wake them up and you ask either one of them, who do you think you are? Al was told before going to sleep that this is gonna happen. So who do you think you are? Do you think you're the original Al or do you think you're dupe? 
And Elga wants to argue that the correct answer for both of them is, I don't know, is a 50-50 chance. Right? That's what his argument is. That's the indifference. What is the credence upon awakening that each should give to being Al or the duplicate? So here's the argument. The argument is, it seems a little complicated, but this is what it took to get there. Imagine you add to that experiment a coin toss. Okay, so Al is asleep. While, they're, while he's asleep, you toss an unfair coin that has a 10% chance of coming up heads, 90% chance of coming up tails. So then at the end of the day, there's four possibilities. Your Al and the coin was heads, your, the dupe and the coin was heads, etc. for tails, right? The claim, which don't worry about, I'm going to justify it on the next slide, but the claim is that if someone said, what is the probability that either you're the original Al and the coin was heads, or you're the dupe and the coin was tails, then the answer you should give is 10%. No, sorry. I said that wrong, sorry, erase that. If you're told, you wake up and you're told, Either you are Al and the coin was heads, or you're the dupe and coin is tails. Then what should you say the probability of the coin being heads is? Okay? And like I said, it's a little bit contrived, but that's the question you're asked. So you know for certainty, you believe the person talking to you, so you know that you're either this or this. And you know there's a 10% chance of being heads and a 90% chance of being tails. You don't know whether you're Al or dupe. So Alga number one claims that the answer you should give to this question is 10%. And if the answer you give that is 10%, then you should have given a 50-50 credence there. The first part is actually a little bit trickier than the second part. So here's the first part. Imagine that for some reason, for some cruel reason, you agreed that after you flipped the coin, if it were heads, you would not wake up you put him into a coma and he would stay dead forever. And if it were tails, you'd do the same thing to Al. Let's just assume that you agree that that was going to happen. And let's assume that Al knew that was going to happen. And the person wakes up, Al or Dupe or whatever it is, and then you're asked, are you... Uh, so you're asked about the coin. Do you think it was heads or do you think it was tails? Right? So the, prob the, the claim is the fact that they woke up didn't teach them anything about the coin. Whether the coin was going to be heads or tails, they were going to wake up. Someone was going to wake up, either Al or Dupe, right? So when they wake up, even if they know that these two conditions were not going to wake up, they learn nothing about the coin. And therefore, they should still give 10% chance to the coin being heads. That's the secret tricky move. If you believe that, then you can easily get to, I'm not going to go through the steps, but you can easily get to 50-50 needed to be the credence in the first place for being Al or being Dupe. And it's a, it's a subtle argument, you have to go through it carefully because if you're willing to believe there is an answer, obviously the answer is going to have to be 50-50, right? You're, there's, you're never going to get it 75%, 25%, right? So you might worry that it's too easy to trick yourself into thinking that you have the right answer when you land on some 50-50 thing, but I think that logically all it, it seems to hold together as far as I can tell. The crucial step was assuming that the coin toss didn't change the probability of being either Al or Dupe, fundamentally. Okay? There was an independence or a separability between the self-locating uncertainty of being Al versus Dupe and whatever the probability for the coin toss to come. So that, we claim, is, this, is a manifestation or an example of this principle that we call ESP, that the environment doesn't matter. In the, the environment, the thing going on outside your local conditions right now is this coin toss. And we claim it didn't matter, right? So if you, so we are agreeing with Elga, but we're pointing out that the assumption that he needed to make his claim is basically what we're calling the ESP. And Elga did, does correctly derive indifference under this particular thought experiment. But rather than applying indifference to Everetti and quantum mechanics, let's Im apply ESP the separability principle to Everetti and quantum mechanics. So, number one, we claim that there is self-locating uncertainty in uh, Everetti and quantum mechanics. So what happens is, there's an apparatus, um, you can tell me if you're not super duper experts on quantum mechanics and we can go into more details about this, but basically there's an apparatus that observes your quantum system, an electron or whatever, 
And very quickly what happens is the wave function branches. And the re reason why it's very quickly is because this macroscopic apparatus interacts with the environment and this procedure, this process called decoherence happens with an incredibly fast time scale. And only later do you, the observer, actually see the outcome of the experiment. And if you want to say, well, I'm going to try to imagine setting up an, uh, an experiment where I see the outcome of the experiment before decoherence happens, you literally cannot do that. You can think of the apparatus as just being your eyeballs. Okay, and your eyeballs will decohere on a time scale of less than a zeptosecond which is much longer than any of the time scales associated with sending the signal to your brain and telling you what is going on. So as a matter of down-to-earth, nitty-gritty, empirical fact, it is always true that the wave function branches because of decoherence before you know what the outcome is. And because that's the case, it is inevitable that there will be self-locating uncertainty. So let's consider, here's a wave function with an observer, a quantum system, an apparatus, and an environment, the whole rest of the universe. So what happens just through the Schrodinger equation is the first thing is that the apparatus looks at the system and it becomes entangled with it. That's measurement according to the rules of quantum mechanics. But almost right away, the apparatus, which after all has a big pointer saying the cat was awake or the cat was asleep or the electron was spin up or spin down, becomes entangled with the environment. Okay, that's when the wave function branches, that's decoherence, that's very fast. Let me just finish this and then we'll, you can ask. And the point is that just mathematically, all these arrows are time evolution, but this is when the branching happens. It's when the environment becomes entangled with the apparatus, the branching happens. So I can distribute that poor observer on both branches of the wave function. And there are two copies of that observer and they're identical. And therefore, that's self-locating uncertainty. And only later does the observer actually read the apparatus and go, aha, the spin was up, or so forth. So our claim is that this period of self-locating uncertainty is absolutely generic in real, realistic quantum measurements. Suppose that wasn't the case. Suppose there were creatures where yeah. um, they would, you'd have conscious quicker than before. Yes. That ruin the whole it might. It might. I mean, I'm certainly not claiming that it wouldn't. Let's put it that way. I mean, so that makes the probabilities that you're going to derive from this dependent on the structure of our... It does, but my very humble project is only explaining all of human experience, not the experience of much quicker animals. If I can do that, I claim some, something good happened, right? Okay. All right, so let's go through, how am I doing? Ooh, I'm not doing very well, but you know, philosophers get, let, let me talk forever, right? Okay. We usually go on for another hour. All right, give me another 15 minutes to follow, finish my slides and then uh, we'll finish. Maybe even less than that, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think we're, we're nearing the end. Um, so here is how this plays out when you're gonna do it right, okay? So what we said is, we have the self-locating uncertainty, we would like to assign credences to being this on this branch or being that branch, two identical observers. Is it just 50-50 or is it something more subtle? So we decompose, as we already sort of implicitly did, Hilbert space into an observer, a system, and an environment. And the statement of ESP, the separability principle, in this quantum context is that when you take the environment and you act on it, so you change the environment from one thing to something else, whatever probabilities you assign to different, being on different branches don't change. Okay, so it's not an indifference principle yet. It doesn't say two probabilities are equal to each other. It's just saying the probabilities don't change if we only change the environment, whatever those probabilities are for some observer measuring some outcome S. So let's give an example in this simple case, okay? Here are two different universes, two different quantum states. There's an observer and there's two different quantum systems, uh, which are represented here by a cat and an alien, okay? So in Psi 1, there's an observer, an awake cat and a hungry alien, an observer, a sleep cat and a friendly alien, and the aliens and the cats are switched in Psi 2. So here is the chain of logic that we have to chase down. Let's imagine we treat the cat as the system we're going to observe. We haven't yet observed it, but we're going to. And we treat the alien as part of the environment. Okay? Then, in that case, you notice that if we just treat the alien as part of the environment, this part of the quantum state is the same in Psi 1 and Psi 2. 
And therefore, whatever the probability is that I'm going to see the cat awake, it's the same in Psi 1 and Psi 2. That's applying ESP and ignoring the aliens. But I could also choose to observe the aliens, and I could treat the cat as part of the environment. In that case, the same structure works, except the things that are the same are this second branch of Psi 1 and this first branch of Psi 2. So the probability the alien is friendly in Psi 1 is the same as it would be in Psi 2. But then, here's where the miracle occurs. In Psi 2, the branch where the cat is awake and the branch where the alien are friendly is the same. So therefore, before looking at anything, whatever number I assign to being the probability that, I'm, that the cat is awake in state 2 has to be the same as the probability I assign to the alien being friendly. That's just one branch of the wave function. Therefore, this equals this equals this, therefore this equals this. The probability that I'm awake in Psi 1 equals the probability the cat is awake equals the probability that the cat is asleep in Psi 1, and those are the only two po probabilities, and they add up to 1, so they're both equal to 1 half. Sorry about the fonts, that's computer change. Okay. That's the Born rule by itself. It's not a very vivid version of the Born rule because it's only in the case where the amplitudes were the same, right? So it's the same as indifference, the probabilities, but you know, it's in the right direction. The good news is, once you get this part of the Born rule, once you get the Born rule, when the amplitudes of the two different branches of the wave function are equal, then there's a known procedure you can plug into for getting the Born rule when the amplitudes are unequal. The crucial thing is that the trick that we just did to get equal probabilities doesn't work when the amplitudes are unequal. If in the very first step, if you ignore the cats, okay, now the branch of the wave function with the friendly alien is different because there's a different number outside. The state is not the same when you ignore the cats as it was. The state psi 1 and state psi 2 are not the same ignoring the cats. So there's no reason to assign equal probabilities as we did before. Okay? So far, there's just nothing that you can really say. They're not treated equally according to ESP. What you can do, there's a trick due to Zurek, Let's imagine that your state is this, you know, some part of the wave function is E1, it's entangled with environment E1, let's say there's a spin up, there's another part with a spin down entangled with E2, and its amplitude is bigger than E1 with a square root of 2 extra factor. Then I can simply choose to decompose, I didn't write it down here, but I can choose to decompose this vector E2 into a sum of two orthogonal pieces, one over the square root of 2 e2 hat and one over the square root of 2 e3 hat. That's just math. I didn't do any physics there, okay? But the point is I can write the whole wave function as a sum of three terms with equal amplitudes, this one, this one, and this one. In one of them the spin is up and in two of them the spin is down. And then I can run my argument from the last couple slides again and get equal probabilities, credences, for being on this branch, this branch, and this branch. So what that means is, if the amplitude is bigger on one branch than another by a certain number, the probability of being on that branch is bigger by that number squared, which is exactly the Born rule. That's the origin of the Born rule. So basically you have a bunch of components that are unequal amplitudes, you slice them, you decompose them into perpendicular components until all the amplitudes are equal, and those are the things you apply equal credences to being in. That is the origin of Born rule. It's really just counting. It's counting equal length components with indistinguishable observers. So our conclusion is that if you do the logic of ELGA, rather than just applying his conclusion, ELGA's logic applied to Everettian quantum mechanics doesn't give you indifference naively, it gives you the Born rule. It gives you the probability is equal to the amplitude squared. So what does that mean about the nature of probability? And I really should just not say this, but you people know more about the nature of probability than I do, so I'll tell you my informal way of thinking about it. Sometimes there's an objection to Everett on the basis of the following fact. What you want to say is, when I observe some quantum system, there is a probability that I will see an answer, right? That I will see the spin is up or I will see the spin is down. That's how we talk in our quantum mechanics classes. 
But Everett says there is deterministic evolution. There's no probability. The probability is one, that this person will evolve into two people. One of which saw the cat awake and one of which saw the cat asleep. So where does probability come in? And the answer we're giving is that it comes in precisely because of self-locating uncertainty. So the origin of probability in a deterministic theory in this case is because given the simple structure of the wave function of the universe at early times, there is an inevitably evolution from knowing where you are to self-locating uncertainty. And the way to resolve that self-locating uncertainty is to give Born rule probabilities. So you start with, once again, cat in a superposition. This is an apparatus. This is the observer. And as we said before, the apparatus entangles, and there are two copies of the observer, and then the observer sees what the apparatus said. So here, in our picture, there is necessarily self-locating uncertainty, and therefore, these two observers both use the Born rule to assign probabilities to where they are in the wave function. And so the suggestion is that even before that happened, up here, that single observer should use the Born rule to assign probabilities to what their descendants will see. So it's really a very tiny shift. It's not what I will see when I do this quantum mechanical observation, because there's not going to be a single I. There's going to be two descendants that I have. But since they're both identical and they're both going to use the Born rule, I will treat the Born rule right now as a probability. That is the way to think about probabilities. It's very epistemic and Bayesian. It is not really objective, but it works. It fits the data, we would claim. OK, so now we can uh, finish up by coming back to the Boltzmann brain question. Let's ignore this. This is boring. I'm going to ignore it. OK, there we go. Uh, da, 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 it's boring. OK, back to the Boltzmann brain question. Um, at the level of the classical uh, physics, the epistemic separability principle gets us Elga's indifference principle for multiple identical observers in the classical universe. And if you believe that, you can't escape the Boltzmann brain problem with a zero-graphic distribution. Because you've given a rational argument that there is one right way to assign credences uh, between Boltzmann U's and ordinary observer U's. You don't have that freedom anymore. Now, you could deny the ESP. That's fine. You're allowed, it's a free country. You can do whatever you want. But if you accept the ESP and get our Born rule derivation that way, you also should treat every occurrence of your local data classically on each branch as equally likely. And that means if you live in a universe that is randomly fluctuating, it's overwhelmingly probable you're a Boltzmann fluctuation, even when you conditionalize on all that you see around you. So does that mean that if, the, that if I think I give a non-trivial prior to such a fluctuating universe, I should non-trivially expect to walk outside and see thermal equilibrium, despite the fact that it was raining this morning? So I. I argue no. I argue that's not the right way to think about it. And the reason why is completely different than anything we've talked about yet. It's cognitive instability. Remember we said that if you do, if you are a Boltzmann U, we could fluctuate exactly into this room. But then with overwhelming probability, there'd be no strong connections between our impressions of the outside world and the actual outside world. So if that were the real world in which we lived, everything that we know about physics and philosophy and logic would have randomly fluctuated into our brains. So if we constructed a theory of the universe, which was eternal and randomly fluctuating, and concluded, therefore, that we were recent random fluctuations, we would have no reason to trust that conclusion because all of our reasoning just randomly fluctuated to our brains. So in, in case you are not um, familiar with the usual story about the past hypothesis, etc. If you live in a universe where there's some data you have about your current local mac macro state, and you have that local data and the laws of physics, there are many possible futures, right? There are many possible things that could happen compatible with the laws of physics and your current macro state. There's an exactly equal number of possible pasts because the fundamental laws of physics are time reversal invariant, and typically your current local macro state uh, has an equal number of time reversed micro states as regular micro states in it. But nevertheless, we seem to have knowledge about the past that we don't have about the future. We have photographs, right? We have memories, we have fossils. 
why do we know more about what past we came from than about the future? And the answer is we have this thing called the past hypothesis. We believe that in the real world, 14 billion years ago with the Big Bang, the universe started with very, very low entropy. So we don't just have our current local macrostate, we have our current local macrostate and a hypothesis about the past which together picks out a relatively small number of possible reconstructions. Given a photograph in your wallet right now that you remember having taken a week ago, it's extremely probable that whatever you took a picture of really existed a week ago, given the low entropy past. If you were really a fluctuation, there'd be no reason to think that that photograph was an accurate reconstruction. Okay? So, random fluctuations can't make this assumption. And therefore, random fluctuations have no reason to trust their reasoning about anything at all. And therefore, my suggestion, my strategy, my coping strategy, is to simply say that we should not take seriously cosmological theories in which there are a lot more Boltzmann observers, Boltzmann brains and Boltzmann U's than there are ordinary observers. Those are universes that are ruled out not because I look around and I see that I'm not a Boltzmann brain, but because I can't live in that universe. <laughs> I can't do physics or philosophy or science or life, you know, or romance or poetry or anything. Everything just randomly fluctuates into existence. I have no reason to believe anything. And that even though that might be true, it's no way to get on with your life. Therefore, you should just assign a prior of essentially zero to universes dominated by Boltzmann brains. And as a working cosmologist, your job is to design empirically successful theories of the whole universe, which are not dominated by these random fluctuations. And I'm, these are just the same things I already said, but let me just now say thank you. All right, so we have time for questions until 7 o'clock. <laughs> yes. So, um, the last thing is the, the thing you just said about a prior. Yeah. So, um, are you really thinking about this as a prior, or is it as, I mean, it sounds to me like you're actually taking into account a lot of information there about what you already know about your own existence, or, or is that not the case? I mean, it's hard. I mean, probably you know better than I do. What should I, what, what meaning should I assign to the word prior? Uh, it, I, I don't make up priors before I existed, right? I mean, I need to make up priors like before I thought about this problem, I guess, right? And so I would say, before knowing what my realistic choices of cosmological models were, if I knew about the Boltzmann brain problem, I would advocate assigning very, very low priors to any of the ones that produce Boltzmann brains. So I'm not using detailed empirical knowledge of my conditions, my local uh, environment. I'm simply using the practical advice that I shouldn't contemplate these you know, radically skeptical uh, versions of reality that wouldn't make the universe intelligible if they were true. Uh, RJ Good said something relevant here. He said, you'll know your priors by their posteriors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I buy that. Again, I'm not an expert on the foundations of probability. There might be some well-known reason why this is either good or bad, but I, you know, I think I could live in a simulation, I could be a brain in a vat, I could be a Boltzmann brain, but it's no way to go through life until there's very, very, very strong evidence otherwise, yeah. One way to catch it out is to say that uh, you can have all a priori beliefs into shaping your priors. Priors about, you know, uh, yeah. it would be impossible to do serious physics without certain kind of hypothesis. So right. that will be admissible into shaping the prize. But I, I was wondering whether um, the reasons you gave were so strong in terms of a priori. For example, if you have a fluctuation into the galaxy with 500 years of histories, mm -hmm. then we can still do a lot of physics, yes. a lot of observations, and we have our memories, our memories, you know, um, to be veridical and accurate, and our future to be probably okay. That's for right. A while. And that seems to be um, escaping the kind of um, a priori consideration to say that universe must be impossible or zero probability. It could, but what I am um, leaning on is the fact that the actual cosmological models I'm considering have the feature that when you can fluctuate into something just the size of our galaxy, it remains true that with overwhelmingly larger probability, you'll fluctuate just into this room plus thermal equilibrium. Well, I mean, 
I guess you don't like the zero graphic distribution, right? So if you have that, you can help yourself too. I, I don't think it's fair, and again, this is an interesting question which I'm happy to change my mind about. My current attitude is it's not fair to pick a zero graphic distribution that treats different, that ob different observers but with the same local conditions differently. I see. That's, I think, the uh, assumption made in the manufacturers when you have the near path hypothesis. Um, you rule out the things after the first epoch before you reach equilibrium. After you reach equilibrium. Sorry, I have to say that again. I didn't so, quite. Um, when you have the past hypothesis, you can have equilibrium and yeah. fluctuation in the future. Mm -hmm. and you add a near path hypothesis saying that we are near the past. We are in oh, the right. first epoch. Yes. It's basically brought bias distribution over um, certain times. Times. Well, right, but I think that. Um, and that, by your, by your consideration, will not be, will not be uh, rational. Because if I were faced, it, so th it's tricky. If I were faced with three different cosmological models, right. one of which had truly any fluctuation with probability e to the minus delta s, right. one of which was thermodynamically sensible, so it was just a good pa past hypothesis, and the other had no local fluctuations, but big fluctuations. So that in other words, if the probability distribution on entropy fluctuations was not e to the minus delta s. Right. Uh, in fact, Andy Albrecht has tried to construct cosmological models of this form, where when there's a fluctuation, it's more likely to be a big fluctuation than a small one, right? I think that would be an interesting uh, edge case where you, you could start asking yourself is there a sort of competition between um, being fair about your zero graphic distributions and ensuring that you have a reason to trust your conclusions based on the data you see. Uh, but I, I think you'd have to sort of go through it by a case by case basis. Right. Uh, really, the, 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 I'm getting all my leverage from the fact that with overwhelming probability, nothing that I believe about the world is reliable in this, in this real thing that I'm trying to rule out. Um, so if I understood that, that cognitive instability wouldn't be a reason for rejecting Albrecht's account. Right. Okay. But there would be a kind of other kind of epistemic, um, I don't know, uh, inf infelicity about it, because the kind of reasoning that we use to back a certain number of years got the evidence we have, all of a sudden goes wacky. Yeah. Right. That seems undesirable. So. Well, that's right. So there, there's, here's a potential empirical question. You know, we see the cosmic microwave background. We attribute this to the cooling plasma after the Big Bang. What if the cosmic microwave background disappeared tomorrow? Right? What would we say? I mean, it might be that the best explanation of that data would be that the, what we thought was radiation from the Big Bang was really just locally coming toward us, and it stopped. And you know, if we continued to accumulate data, I think that basically the right thing to do would be the thing people would actually do, which would be to say, I have this crazy hypothesis that the microwave background was not associated with the Big Bang, but maybe our telescope just broke. Let, you know. But as they accumulated more and more data about it to realize that what they thought was a 14 billion year old past hypothesis was much more recent, then you would switch to, you would switch to that. But all that is only possible if you're at least in the subset of environments that are thermodynamically sensible, right? that do have uh, some reliability with respect to their local environment. Give someone else a try, yeah. Yeah, I have a question about the, what's it, the ESP principle? Yes. Um, so, you said that it's, uh, the macroscopic indistinguishability is the criterion for identity of right. the Um But that's not going to be the criterion of identity for subsystems of the environment, I would right. assume, because we want, um, well, because we want to, like, say, when this electron comes out spin up, that, you know, when this electron comes out spin down, those are those are distinct, so of course they're not macroscopically distinct. I mean, I, think, I don't think that there is a uh, condition on identity in the environment, right? Um, well, I'm thinking you're going to get one on a, if you just say the environment is just take out the, um, the observer, then you'll have one automatically. They have identical envir environments if when you take out the observer you get macroscopically indistinguishable statistical pairs. 
And in fact, you kind of need some sort of identity conditional environments, right? Because the whole principle is built about, uh, it's built on the concept of like, even if this environment, if this environment has a different feature from the, so, so you need a concept of identity or non-identity environments from like, in the first place. I think, I think I'm missing something. This is what I need. <laughs> I need literally that I can do unitary transformation on the environment and that doesn't change the probability that I'm going to, the credence I'm going to attach to being one branch or another. So can I connect that with what you're trying to say? Um, yeah, okay. So may, maybe I'm latching on to like the, the more loosey-goosey version of the principle. Yeah, there, we actually yeah. list different versions of the principle in the paper, yeah. a loosey-goosey version, and this is what we actually need so okay. to prove what we want to prove. Okay. Um, oh. I'm, the, the worry that's in the back of my mind is that the kinds of dynamics that issue as a principle are microdynamics, and that micro details of the like environment, et cetera, are going to be relevant for its application. But the oh. way you're individuating some su subsystems is macroscopically. And so you get there's this kind of there's a sort of mismatch between so just to set up the whole problem, okay, yeah. this one or this one or this one. I agree with you, it's like a macroscopic problem, but the characterization has these microscopic. I mean, I think this is a kind of a typical Everettian thing where you don't take microscopic and macroscopic too literally, like, and also don't take environment and system too literally in the following sense. Like, I can describe myself. <coughs> Like I have Avogadro's number of particles more than that in me, and each of them have spin and location and momentum. So there's this huge dimensional Hilbert space. But when I describe myself, when I say macroscopically identical, I, I am imagining just as I do when I derive Boltzmann's version of the second law and, and chunk up microstates into macrostates, that there is some tiny subset of that data that is accessible to me macroscopically. And the way that plays out quantum mechanically is I would describe myself as a living in a tensor product of some macro variables and some micro variables. And I think all I need is that the macro variables of the two things I want to say are identical or the same regardless of what their micro variables are doing. The micro variables could be identical or not. It, just, it actually just doesn't matter. And likewise for the environment. I think that's actually quite a weak condition. Eddie. So are you related to Ida's question about the ESP? So I was thinking about the diagram again. We have uh, two quantum states, say A, B, C, and D. So it's absorb, right. uh, sleep, yeah, this one. Um, so we do this equivalence in, in the proof. We say um, this is equal to this, mm -hmm. and this is equal to this by ESP. Right. And therefore, these two are the same. And similarly for one third and two thirds. Yes. I think uh, there is a similar objection to maybe this application as David Albert's objection to Wallace's proof of decision theory. Okay. So in that case, Wallace was claiming that the following equivalence principle holds. If you prefer A over B and C over D, then setting aside the environment, you prefer A superposition with B to C superposition with D. Mm -hmm. um, basically trying to determine preferences over right. superpositions by looking at preferences over single states. Okay. And Albert's, Albert's rejection is that um, it does not. Okay. The preferences over single worlds, single outcomes, don't uniquely determine preferences over um, joint outcomes when we have superposition between this plus this. So similarly here, I was thinking, okay, so ESP give me, I prefer A o and C, sorry, I, I mean different between, sorry, I have same credits of, uh, of A and C and B and C. Yeah. Um, but does not give me the same credence when A is in the, the same superposition with B, uh, or C with D. So you're, re you're rejecting the, set, the principle. In the case of preference, it's, it doesn't, the principle that Wallace uses doesn't seem that plausible. Here it seems much more plausible. Yeah, because this branch is just one branch. I was thinking before you are at side two of side one, you are before doing an experiment, you're thinking, what should my credence be? Right. So, but, but, but I'm, I'm not superimposing preferences or anything. Right, right. Uh, I'm, I'm really comparing, at every step, I'm only comparing individual branches. I'm never comparing superpositions. 
I'm saying the probability of this branch is the same as this, probability of this branch is the same as this. Therefore, this, then just numerically, <laughs> this yeah. is a number. Right. It's equal to this number. <laughs> it's also equal to that number. But Therefore, arithmetic. I, uh, by diachronic consistency, I should have the same criticism as my descendants, right? That's the yeah. And at that stage, before measurement, I should have criticism about, well, I, I will be, I'll be most likely to be in the future. And I could have um, different criticisms when there's single world or with multiple worlds. Um, so my, my criticisms over A and C and B and D could change if A and C, A and B are in position uh, later, and C and D are in position later. That so may be, but I don't need it. <laughs> well, this is all I need to get the Born rule. So go to the next slide again. We sure. have the, uh, after, I think, this one? No, it's the bottom one. Like this one? Right. Which one do you want? This one, with the, with the words, I think. With the words, yeah. okay. So therefore, you should use the rule to assign probably to the future. Yeah. But what I need to get that is just comparing things at this time. But if I deny that I should have the same criticisms now as my future de descendants, that wouldn't go through right, the argument. I'm not sure what you're denying. You're, I, so I, I agree that all my descendants use the Bohr rule. Yes. But I can still deny that therefore I should use the Bohr rule to assign probably to the future. I don't see why, how you can deny that. So I'm not saying that, I'm not weighting you know, utility functions or anything like right. that, right? I'm saying that I know that I'm gonna be duplicated. There's gonna be many copies of me in the future. I'm not gonna know which one I am. But I know that after I'm duplicated, every one of them has a very certain probability they will assign to being every one of them. So I should assign that probability ahead of time. Why is that? It's not by ESP or by indifference. No, it, it's some reflection principle for... That's called diachronic consistency, a version of that in the um, I think it's weaker than that, but okay. I mean, yeah, I, I would like diachronic consistency, right. yes. And that, that, was this, that was the last issue between the Albert Wallace debate, I think, is when, um, whether you can... Um, so, I think in the end, Wallace proved the Bohr rule using diachronic consistency, and that's ultimately what the intuition divergence. So Albert's saying, well, this is not a rational requirement, but Wallace said this is a rational requirement. Well, I would certainly, uh, I would, I'm, I think that I'm certainly happy to accept diachronic consistency as something that I would like in my, in my portioning of credences. Um, but it, that's different than what you started saying, because at no point do I ever superimpose uh, probabilities or credences. Right, 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 that's right. But he's saying that um, diachronic consistency is where we used to connect the descendants' credences yeah. to your. Yeah, so there's certainly something going on here. Yeah. But so this was, I, I claim I've already derived the Born rule, but this is sort of recovering our standard understanding of the Born rule, and, and maybe that, um, there's a version of the Born rule I derived, the version that I it, it applied after decoherence, right? After the branching has happened. Post measurement. That's right, so that's a Born rule, right? But I also want to be able to speak the language that I teach my undergraduates about making a measurement, and I think that this is what uh, lets me do that. Um, that's, what, that's what you really need the Born rule, right? Probably, yeah, yeah, probably. I mean, it'd be a weird world where I didn't have it before I did the measurement, but I did after. <laughs> so Eddie's point is that you're making this other assumption. Yes, I agree that there's another assumption to do that. Consistency, and uh, diachronic consistency does assume some, that your degrees of belief or your credences are changing right. rationally. And that's, I, that I'm worried that there's a kind of circularity here because I didn't get your point at first, but this is what it seems to me. <laughs> there's yeah. a kind of circularity because, um, you, you know, if, where you don't have diachronic consistency, just in a non-splitting case, right. is where you think that you might get drunk later and have you know, some sort of funny belief, so you shouldn't obey the reflection principle. But here, it, you're, you're demanding diachronic consistency because you're, you're, 
assuming that it's rational to change your degrees of belief by right. the Born rule. Right. When am I changing my degrees of belief here? Well, from, from, the, from, the, from the earlier time to when you're... Well, I'm saying they're, they're the same in these two. Yes, but, but, so I'm not changing them. Yes, but it... it is that a it, subset it's of changing? It, yeah, yes, but it's... A <laughs> Relating, change. yes. Yeah, it's a, an updating. Yes, okay, right. So, I mean, are you proposing that there is some other rational thing to do in this circumstance? I mean, well, it's always that I don't have a clue of you. <laughs> I don't um, think that, you it's know... It's rational risk to you have no clue. I, I think the thing to think about is whether Eddie pointed out a, a, an assumption in the argument which um, may involve a circularity. So I think there's an assumption. I, don't, I still don't see why it would be a circularity. Um, uh, I'm not assuming... I mean, th there is another principle. So there's a derivation of how we assign credences in this particular case of self-locating uncertainty. And then there's sort of a recommendation about how to think of our splitting selves at earlier times. And that recommendation uses diachronic consistency. But I don't see any circle. Where's the circle? Circle is why is recommendation rationally required? Um, it may be permissible to use that. But if it's not required, then we don't have the board rule for pre-measurement uncertainties. But that's not, so. Number one, I don't believe that. But number two, it's still not a circularity. It's just you're just so saying that I need another I assumption. It's circular. You may not find convincing, but it was comparing it with the reflection principle, which works perfectly right as long as you're updating by Bayesian conditionalization. So if you're not updating by Bayesian conditionalization, reflection isn't right. So if somebody was arguing for Bayesian conditionalization by way of the reflection principle, they will have. Oh, okay. They're going to that's, that's why. That I sounds circular, it. yes. Right, but I'm not sure that it's analogous. Yeah, I don't think it's quite, but okay. I, that's why I said it. Right, that, that would be a worry. I get it, yeah, okay. Um, but I think, you know, there's, you know, I think the Chip has more nuanced views of this than I do because he's read some of this, these worries in the literature. Um, and we've talked about it a lot, and he's never convince me there's an actual problem. Like the, the strongest that I've become convinced of is that someone could stubbornly refuse to think this way. <laughs> Never there's a good way to think. Like this is like, so the ESP itself is an assumption, right? And you could deny that if you want to. And I think David would even, even deny the ESP. And so my attitude there is look, the theory is trying to tell us something. And the thing is telling us fits the data. So just declare victory and, and do other things, right? Like, you know, uh, the, you could just stubbornly insist that there were other uh, measures you could put on things other than the one that the theory told you to use, and then you would get the experiments wrong. So I mean, it's not like there's some empirical puzzle that would be solved by choosing a different measure, right? Um, this is the one that both the theory says and fits the data. So why, why are you complaining about this? Enough. I mean, I agree. <laughs> this is the one that will do the job, <laughs> giving you the floor rule. But the question is whether, um, I mean, for Emeritians to prove the floor rule is a very uh, noble task. But it's one I think I, I really respect, is to say that even if, if the world does not have probabilities, um, Rational agents ought to have the boring probabilities about the branching structure. And right. to prove that, we have to show that it is a rational requirement. Not just that it's rationally permissible to do this, but rationally required to have these credences pre and post measurements. Well, I think, sorry, I think so. What I, what I would say is it's rationally required given some assumptions. I'm admitting that it is logically possible to deny those assumptions. Um, but right. then all you're left with is I can say nothing. But the assumptions have to be a priori plausible. Well, you, yeah. <laughs> you can reject Everett. I mean, sure. <laughs> yes. Well, you can reject Everett uh, empirically, but uh, but I would still want to know, were Everett true, what would I predict? You might accept a uh, version of one of the hidden variable theories. No, but right. But so I'm still left with the question. I would want to know, if this were the world, is there some prediction I would make about experimental outcomes? I think and David would just say there isn't any. Right. Yeah. And there's right. a reason to reject that this is what the world is like. 
That's right. Uh, the reason, right. But, and I think that if, so my attitude is that if there's some extremely mild, unobjectionable extra assumptions that gets a unique answer, and there's no equally mild, unobjectionable assumptions that get a different answer, and that answer agrees with the data, I go home. If I think branch counting is very natural measure, branch counting in some kind of appropriate sense, well, it's not a very natural measure, really. I think that I think that um, it's it's sort of less natural than the ESP, and it's not diachronically consistent, and blah 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 blah. It's you know, Is it's good old indifference, uh, symmetry. Um, but I think I think that's exactly what Elga helped us understand. That rather than positing indifference, yeah, yeah, we I derive mean, it yeah. from mm -hmm. even more fundamental right, right, things. Right. Yeah. So so this works out, let's say, for probabilities in self-locating situations. What about probabilities as applied, let's say, to ordinary statistical mechanics in a finite universe? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, is that just a, there there seem to be objective probabilities connected to frequencies and I, totally independent. Uh, so good, this is a very, very good question. So my suspicion, which I didn't quite work up the courage to say out loud, because the room is full of people who are more experts than I am, is that all the real probabilities are epistemic and Bayesian in the world. In statistical mechanics, I don't know what the microstate is. And I have a sensible measure to use over the space of microstates, and I use that, and it gets me the right answer. But the argument for the sensible measure there can't be this be the same as this argument. No, but it's still, it's the spirit, and the, I had another slide that I deleted just because I had too many slides. The spirit underlying everything we're doing is if the dynamics of the theory keeps pointing you in the direction of a certain measure, then just go there. <laughs> and in statistical mechanics, there is the Liouville measure. It's the unique measure defined by the dynamics that is invariant under time evolution. Pick it. Well, it's okay. It could be living in a well, we don't want to pick it, period. We better pick it with the past hypothesis. Yeah, if yeah, sure. The past hypothesis. But if we just followed what you just said, we just picked the Louisville measure. Well, then so that would instantly lead to um, yeah, cognitive instability. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So, yeah. So, that's right. Um, but suppose we, could, we can imagine a world, or that we are physically possible world, in which the frequencies diverge right, enormously from what the probabilities would be from giving the Louisville measure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Those who lived in a world like that. Yeah. Those people are in bad luck, right? <laughs> so, so, that, so the response to that is just... That so I feel sorry for those people, yes. That the probabilities are different from the ones given by the Louisville measure. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, this is a, a classic anti everettian argument is there will be branches of the wave function where all sorts of weird, unlikely things happen. I feel bad for those people, but... Well, well you, you've appropriated the word unlikely for your probability measure. Yes. Those, these guys wouldn't know what that, right? Well, they would get the theory of the world wrong, right? They would draw incorrect conclusions. So in any of these multiverse models where there's many different possibilities going on, there's, it's very generic that doing their best, every observer, you know, comes up with a conclusion about what the universe is probably like, and they won't agree. Right, because some of them will be in the really unlikely tales. So you think that they couldn't come up, they wouldn't come up with quantum mechanics? Yeah, or StatMech, right? They would think that StatMech was a very different theory. I can see that. That's, why wouldn't they come up with the dynamics, same that with classical dynamics and just a different probability distribution from steps? Well, okay, that's what I'm counting StatMech with the usual probability distribution, yeah. Right. I mean, if every time you put two blocks together of equal temperature, one of them got hotter and one of them got colder, they would derive something, but I wouldn't call it stat mech. It would be, you know, based on some weird thing, right? So in the multiverse, in Everett even, that people like that exist. They're really, 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 really low measure. If I were in the past and were wondering whether it, I should think of myself as going to evolve into them, I would put a pro small probability on it. So the other view, though, would be to say that there were the reason the right reason the stat mech probability distribution is the right probability distribution is not because it's the rational one uh, period, but it's because the world has certain frequencies in it, and that's what makes it the rational probability distribution. So the, these are um, two different accounts of what, what makes that the right yeah, probability distribution. That's right. So I'm just um, 
I don't mean this is a criticism. I mean it's yeah, no, it more vivid what the right what, you know the different views about how to think about probability. Uh, yeah, and so I'm I, I'm sort of tentatively not having thought deeply about the foundations of probability, but I'm you know uh, tentatively maximally Bayesian about these things, and I think that. You know, let's put it this way. What if uh, GRW were right? What if there was some true quantum dynamics that seemed that was truly random, right? Um, as an eternalist, I would say really there is some definite answer to what the answer for the outcome of every quantum measurement is going to be. I just don't know what it's going to be, right? But it's there in the future. It's just not accessible to me um, by memory or experiment or anything like that. So the right way to talk about probabilities is still not as frequencies, it's just my lack of knowledge about what that future actually is. Right. The frequency person would say, there's a fact about what the frequencies are forever, mm -hmm. too, and the right way to talk about probability is given by the frequencies. No, exactly, I'm not denying the, so I'm, I'm you can be a frequentist. I would like to understand better how these two ways of thinking connect with each other. Well, I think here, it only makes, my, my brain only wraps around this if I think from a Bayesian perspective. Right, I wouldn't use the word Bayesian there because Bayesian okay. might mean for the, the, the way of making inferences. I'm a Bayesian in that sense. Sure. But Should I say epistemic or what do you, yeah. what can we say? Yeah. Yeah, so I think of probabilities yeah, here as epistemic. So one of the, the, the frequency way of thinking about probability seems to make no sense in the right. variety in the count. Yep, I, I would totally grant that. And that was my reason for not liking the Everettian account. <laughs> yeah. So I would give anyone else a chance before I stay in this corner? No? Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. I'm, but I've already gone. So. Uh, yeah, he's gone several times. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, I wanted to follow up on Eddie's original question. So um, I wanted to make, I think I'm just even confused about what the propositions are that the probabilities are assigned to. Mm -hmm. So in the second case, is it Take the person who sees the cat asleep. Is it that they they distribute the credences like this? They say my credence is fifty percent that I'm in the cat sleeping world. Mm -hmm. Ranch. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then the person before that at the top, they say something like, "There's a fifty percent chance that I will be that is it that I am in the world that will be the cat sleeping world." Right, so no, that's not what you should say. Like the whole point of this really is as much to clean up our language as anything else. Uh, the, but the upshot is act as if only one world becomes real with a certain probability, right? Um, th the super correct words to say are, I'm going to become two people. Both of those people should assign born rule credences to the outcomes of the experiments. That's the correct thing to say. Okay, so on most theories of personal identity, that's not going to be true. Yeah, I think that that's most very weird sort of person. Most theories of personal identity need a little bit of improving in an ever-ending world. <laughs> I was going to say, if you were just more careful in the original world about the semantics of the decimals, like I, you might be able to. I want to. You might not have to commit to like. I want to be person. much more radical with respect to personal identity, since I'm okay. so I am in love with the physics, and I could take or leave the theories of personal identity. I think that personal identity is overrated. It's uh, there's one person here, and there are two people there. But there are, there aren't two people there. The you just said there's one person there. No. You the just said is I will be this person and I will be that person. So there are. I will. I will evolve into two people. I don't, so in this way of thinking, there's not even, even classically, there's not one person through time. There's me now, there's the thing I will evolve into one minute from now and two minutes from now, et cetera. The extra Everettian feature is that I evolve into more than one person in the future. So, no biggie. Okay, I was thinking you were saying the third of three options. So the first option was uh, that everybody's gonna reject. I am just the time slice right now. So I refer it just to my time slice. So I am not the person later because no time slice. It, these are different time slices. It's one answer in the in the literature on this. Yeah. So I want to accept that thing that everyone rejects. The, no, no. Not, not everyone accepts that. The second one is no. Uh, as you said everyone rejects it. Th that's one of the standard answers. Right, but that's one I want to accept. I like that one. You like the time slice too. Yeah, I think that you should. But then you aren't the person later. 
According to exactly. That the, that's the person that descends from me. That's not me. Okay. There's no objective reality three to. Here. There's you at time t yeah. zero, time t one, time t two. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, it's odd to think that there's a rationality requirement on what one person. So you then your rationality That's why it says requirement has this logic. You're saying what a different person should believe on the basis of what I. Like. You're, Yes. Two different people. And That's right. The requirement is, it's, it's not even a diachronic consistency requirement. That's it's why. It's a requirement on different persons. Right. Like what different persons should believe. The beliefs of person yes. error is the same as person B. It is. That, seems, that is an unusual rationality requirement. I think that, so I think it's one, so if, thinking of. I'm not so convinced anymore that it's a super simple, sort of innocuous. Well, it's, you know. I think that the right answer to the ship of Theseus is that it's a different ship every second. <laughs> so it's not complicated sure. to say. That's a fine answer. Yeah, I'm not objecting to that. I'm objecting yeah. to then having this rationality. So I would well, say there's, if you have two separate people, uh, there's no rational constraint on what one person should believe uh, generated by like what another person should believe. You have two people who are completely spatially and temporally separated and never interact. But you're denying that. Well, but there, it's not that they're completely separated and never interact. One is the descendant of another okay. one, right? Yeah. I mean, so what I would say is that the, you know, the Everett makes frighteningly real all of these weird philosophical thought experiments about duplication and teleportation machines and so forth, which have always been used to call into questions issues of personal identity. And the right thing to do is to start from scratch with personal identity and talk about different people at different times and how they relate to each other. And I'm sure it's doable. This is part of that project, like this epsilon of that big project, but I think that I, I, and again, I could be wrong, I'm very willing to give up on the intuitive notions of personal identity in favor of a better understanding of what happens in the wave function of the universe. Cool, okay. Eddie, do you have something to do? Oh yeah, just kind of follow up on uh, Barry's point earlier. So I think you could say in quantum statistical mechanics, uh, the state is a mixed state, density matrix. Sure. They don't have a distribution over neutral wave functions anymore. Sure. So we don't have probability. I was just or talking a language of classical statistical mechanics, classical but statistics. that's what I was talking about. When I, I said the Liouville measure. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, the world is quantum. You should use density operators. Yeah. Yes. Can I? Are yep. there any other questions? All right. Can I? I, I still, I'm still stuck on understanding your reasoning in the, regarding the ESB and how it plays with the cat. So, can I just, so, okay. So am I right that the, the things in the ket uh, are the states here, are the, what is the environment in this situation? Well, I could have included an extra environment, but the environment is, I'm, I'm imagining different circumstances under which I am deciding to look at different quantum systems. So I'm imagining that there's an observer, there's a cat, there's an alien, and also there's the whole rest of the environment that I'm not even looking at right now. But if I choose to look at the cat, then I'm treating the alien as part of the environment, and vice versa. So I have two boxes, both with a spin in them. I'm going to choose to open one or the other. If I choose to open one, the other one, as far as I'm concerned, is, the environment, is part of the environment. And if I do that, if I do open it, then of course there's time evolution, which is not here, but the time evolution would entangle whatever's in that box with the actual rest of the environment and the pictures that I showed you before would apply. So these two, these two things, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to call them yet, that are being found equal or equivalent. Yeah. So the two pairs of things that are being found equal or equivalent. Are they being found equal or equivalent in the same environment? Yes, but of course, depending on whether or not I, the observer measured the cat or the alien, the Hamiltonian would evolve the state in different ways. 
But in either case, there would be a moment of self-locating uncertainty when the observer was in the same system and everything else was different. Yes. I had two other things I wanted to about. Um, one is you mentioned at the beginning that one of the places where we have this sort of um, wonder where we are is um, in the inflationary multiverse scenario. Right. So there, you sometimes hear people say something like this: that anything that can happen happens in some multi some universe or other. And so there's a problem of finding a measure of it. Right over them. Um, I don't see that what you, anything you've said so far gets that measure. Yeah, because that's the, exactly the transparencies I slipped over. <laughs> so in principle, you can apply ESP to that circumstance, right? In, in other words, this is sort of a mixed um, quantum probability, because there's different branches of the wave function, and on each branch there can be multiple observers. So there's mixed classical and quantum uncertainty. So we have an equation. The probability of being, so on each branch, there's an amplitude. You square that and you call that a weight. So this weight is, gets attached to every observer on that branch in your reference class. And the probability of being any particular observer is that weight divided by the sum of all weights, because the sum need not add to one, right? Okay. So, in principle, this is a derived rather than postulated measure in some big multiverse. In practice, it might not be uh, regularizable in any way in a universe with an infinite number of observers. So we don't solve the measure problem in any good sense. But at least we're not guessing it, we're just pointing out that the, the actual measure you should use has all the problems of the ordinary guesses. Right. Right. So I mean, what you would want it is some story about inflationary cosmology which would make multiverses, universes with the cosmic background fluctuations like ours right. and so on. That's right. So I did, you know, I, I briefly entertained exactly that hope that, um, that branches that you could actually, you know, so usually when cosmologists talk about the multiverse, because they're fallible human beings who don't really take quantum mechanics seriously. They draw these semi-classical pictures of bubbles nucleating, right, and with a certain probability. So what they really mean is that there is a wave function that evolves into a superposition of all these different possibilities. So you could imagine that you get lucky and in a quasi-realistic or at least a toy model version of that, the branches where you make lots of observers somehow get their weights killed off by a, um, and the probability gets squelched even though there's lots of observers there. In the toy models I could construct that did not actually happen. <laughs> so yeah, so I think that um, I don't see why it would happen. I don't see why it would, but you know, you have a new equation, you gotta try it out, right? Like, you know, you gotta, you want you to be the discoverer of that, not someone else, if it's true. Um, so, yeah, so uh, I think that's a, I have no strong opinions about how to resolve that problem, but it's, it's a good one. Yeah. I have weak opinions, but. No, you have one more question. I one more yeah. thing. It was the thing I brought up that I still don't know exactly what to think of. Um, if, if, in fact, there were some creatures um, who became conscious uh, of a result right. prior to decoherence, so maybe that just doesn't make any sense. I think it's possible it doesn't make any sense, right. yes. Like, there's no definition of consciousness that uh, occurs faster than decoherence time. That would be weird. But maybe, like, I'm, I'm, I'm granting you that it's possible, but I just, I'm just saying, exactly. I don't need to worry if about it. If that were possible, then those creatures wouldn't get the st same statistics that you get there. I think those creatures, you know, the standard, you know, at, when, you, when you give the sales pitch for Everett and what he's trying to solve, you very often say, you know, if I open the box with Schrodinger's cat in it, I never see a superposition. Right. I think your critters would see superpositions. <laughs> Maybe and after a little while they wouldn't see superposition. That's right. They would fade away or something like that. Yeah. That's great talk. Thanks. So much. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. All right.